Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mary Ann Farkas, and I'm the Director of Training at the Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation at Boston University. Welcome to the third presentation in our web broadcast series. This morning, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. James Prochaska, who will be giving a lecture this afternoon entitled, Helping Populations Progress Through Stages of Change. James Prochaska is the director of the Cancer Prevention Research Consortium and a professor of clinical and health psychology at the University of Rhode Island. He is the author of over 150 publications. He is internationally recognized for his work as the developer of the stage model of behavior change. Dr. Prochaska has won numerous awards, including the Top 5 Most Cited Authors in Psychology Award from the American Psychological Society and the L.C. Robbins Award for Career Contributions to Health Promotion. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. James Prochaska. Thank you. It's great to be with you today and want to welcome the folks from around the world who would be uh, participating over the web. Just want to let you know I brought my passport with me so I could be <laughs> free to travel worldwide. This is a first for me, so it's a pleasure to participate in this new way of reaching many more people on what I believe is the most important issue in all of health, and that is how do we help patients and populations to change the behaviors, the problems that are the major killers of our time, the major factors of impacting on quality of life, and we shall see also the major cost drivers in health care. We've known for decades that behaviors like smoking, alcohol abuse, sedentary lifestyles, uh, diet, stress, depression, chronic hostility, that those have been the major causes of chronic disease and premature death. But more recently, we have seen how they impact on health care costs. In the United States, health care costs are, whoops, are $1.2 trillion a year, going back to double-digit inflation, in part because our managed care organizations have invested heavily in cutting costs. They've invested very little in preventing costs. <coughs> of those totals, pharmaceuticals account for only 8% of total health care costs. Behaviors account for 60%. But the way that mental health services have been delivered, the way that behavior medicine has been practiced in the United States, we impact effectively on less than 10% of those costs. So if we are going to impact on the quality and quantity of life for growing numbers of people and on the growing health care costs, we will need to develop services that can reach entire populations, not just individual patients. Here's some examples. When managed care offers state-of-the-science smoking cessation programs for free, removing price as a barrier, the percentage of smokers who participate nationwide is 1%. Okay. If we offer home-based programs where people can use them at home and not have to go to clinics, which is a real barrier, we can get that up to 5%. If we look at mental health services, national statistics are clear. People with DSM-4 diagnoses, less than 25% ever receive professional services in their lifetime, let alone for any particular episode or problem that they are facing. Part of the problem has been our very paradigm of behavior change. In the U.S., we are a very action-oriented society, and so we historically define change as equaling taking action. Somebody changes when they quit drinking, when they start to take medication for depression, when they begin to lose weight, when they go for help with rehabilitation. And that type of action paradigm is, as we shall see, part of the problem. About 20 years ago now, we were taught by about 1,000 ordinary Rhode Islanders a very different approach to change. We followed these folks for two years, looking at their successes and failures, and these people taught us something about change that was not in any of the 300 
systems of psychotherapy, counseling, behavior change. They taught us that change involves progress through a series of stages. We don't throw out all that we learned about action over the last 50 years, but rather we integrate it as one of six stages. And so change is not an event, but rather it's a process that unfolds over time and involves progress through these stages. We'll take and briefly look at the nature of these stages and then see how we can uh, apply this alternative paradigm to help many more people than we ever imagined possible. We start with pre-contemplation. This is a stage in which people are not seriously intending to take action in the foreseeable future. We usually measure that as the next six months. We will see that people in this stage underestimate the benefits of changing, they overestimate the costs, and they're typically not conscious that they are making that mistake. And if they're not conscious of that, the chances are that they will be stuck in this stage for a long period of time, doing damage to themselves or to others, to quantity or quality of life. Historically, we label these patients not motivated, we label them as non-compliant, resistant, not ready for therapy or for our services. We now know that it was us who were not ready for them. It was us who were resistant to change in our services to match their needs. And it was us who were not motivated to understanding what their needs were so that they could progress and participate in the change process. We will see that these are not like stages of child development where children seem to be motivated internally to progress from one stage to the next. Like our grandson who when he was crawling was getting about in the world very well, yet was clearly driven and motivated to progress to walking even though he had to fall on his face, had to experience failure, still was driven to master the next behavior of walking. We find only two naturally occurring forces in our research that can move people out of these stages. One we call developmental events, so that uh, in our research the mean age of smokers finally reaching maintenance is 39, and those of us who've gone through age 39 know that it's a mean age. That it's an age where we stop to evaluate how we've been living, whether we want to die from the way we've been living, or whether we want to enhance the quality and quantity of the rest of our lives. Or there can be environmental events. So one couple that we followed, both heavy smokers, their dog of many years, died from lung cancer. That eventually led the wife to quit smoking, and the husband bought a new dog. So even the same event can be processed very differently by different people. In the addiction field, we have had the myth that people with addictions must hit bottom before they will be motivated to change. They must have a crisis. And that myth leads families and friends, physicians, and other potential helpers to sit around passively, helplessly, waiting for the person to hit bottom waiting for them to be fired, waiting for them to have an accident, a heart attack, some other crisis that could break them out of this stuck point. We would never do that in oncology. The earliest signs of cancer would lead us to find some kind of way to help the patient progress towards taking effective action. So now, instead of waiting for those kinds of crises or bottoms to occur, to powerful events like having a heart attack, turning 39, having a dog die of lung cancer, we can add our interventions that can help people break out of this stuck point and progress to the next stage. We will see once they progress into contemplation that their awareness, appreciation of the benefits of changing goes up, but often their awareness of the cons go up as well. 
because if I am seriously intending to change a long pattern, a long-standing lifestyle or behavior, I start to have to consider that it will cost me in terms of time, in terms of emotion, in terms of effort, in terms of risk of failure, in terms of often having to give up some things, changing my sense of myself, and that increase in the awareness of the costs in contemplation can lead to profound ambivalence. Is it worth it? Is it not? Should I keep progressing? Should I put it off? And in fact, patients in contemplation have been the ones who have really fooled us the most in the past. They will typically, for example, with smoking, they will say they're seriously intending to quit for good in the next six months. Without our help, less than 50% will quit for 24 hours in the next 12 months. Okay. The rule of thumb for contemplation is, when in doubt, put it off. Okay. Don't act. And what produces that doubt? Well, part of it is non-communications. If their physicians don't ask them about their drinking, don't ask them about their exercise, don't ask them about their depression, how important can it be if they don't take time to take and assess those areas and see what the needs are. So the non-communications can lead uh, to doubt. But also media can take and add doubts as well. For example, in the health area, the most rapidly growing problem, one of the few areas in the behavioral health area that's going in the wrong direction in the United States, in the UK, and in most industrialized nations, is weight. Since 1988, weight has been going like this. Participation in weight management programs has been going down dramatically. And part of that is mass media like Newsweek publishes a story, does fat matter to health? Nice. As if they never heard of type 2 diabetes. But they take and review a study that said if you're both fat and fit, maybe you won't die sooner. But if you look closely, that study said it was based on a very small N of people who were both obese and fit, and what do we know about generalizing from small ends? It can lead to very big mistakes. And when Surgeon General Coop wrote into Newsweek to challenge that story, they refused to publish his letter. So we can have non-communications from healthcare professionals, miscommunications from mass media, and other ways of feeding that ambivalence. So these folks will fool you, Historically, I've joked with my students that when you talk about therapy terminable and interminable, what you need to do is combine a patient in, in contemplation with a therapist who loves to contemplate, and you can have lifetime therapy, okay? Because they both can agree to put the action off, uh, in part because when you go to take action, the risks of failure are much greater than with contemplation. Again, these folks can, when matched, uh, have therapy matched to their needs, can break out of this stuck point and progress towards preparation. In preparation, these are folks who are intending to take action in the near future. We usually measure that as the next month. They are convinced that the benefits of acting outweigh the costs. They typically have a plan. It may be to go for professional help, it may be to go for self-help, it may be to get a self-help book, or it may be a plan they create on their own. Their number one concern is, when I act, will I fail? And that's not an irrational anxiety, it's a realistic concern, because when it comes to changing most any chronic behavior, the rule of any one action attempt is relapse rather than sustained action. So it's a realistic fear, but we also know that the better prepared people are, the more likely they are to reach their goals. And so we put much more emphasis on preparation rather than on motivation. Because many people think of motivation as something that happens to them. If you're not motivated enough, what can you do about it? Wait until you turn 39? Wait until you get fired, okay? Whereas with preparation, we grow up in athletics and academics knowing 
that the better prepared we are, the more likely we are to reach our goal. And preparation is much more under our control. So we like to make sure folks are well prepared before they take action to give themselves the best chance. Once they take action, their changes are now clearly visible. People can see that they've quit drinking, they've started exercising, they're taking their medication, whatever the action target is, it's much more observable. It's part of the reason why historically we equated change with action, because we can observe it. But we will see all the work that people do before they take action and the work they have to do to sustain that action. This is the most demanding time where people have to work the hardest. And we typically estimate that it's about a six month sustained effort to get through this most demanding stage. And part of the problem is, is that many people aren't prepared for how long action will take. For example, average smoker thinks the worst will be over in a few days or a few weeks, when in fact it's about six months of concerted effort. Biologically, the worst is over in a few days. Nicotine withdrawal is over in that time. Psychologically, behaviorally, it's a longer period. So we need to teach them and help them to prepare themselves to think of this as the behavioral equivalent of life-saving surgery. If you were going through life-saving surgery, would you give yourself six months of concerted effort to recover? Would you let others know that you're not going to be at your best during that time? That you're going to need more support? That this is going to have to be one of your top priorities? To make sure that it has the level of importance and commitment made, needed to get through this demanding time. After about six months, people progress into maintenance. Historically, we used to think of maintenance as basically a stable state, stage where people don't have to work. We'll see that they do need to work to keep moving ahead, but they don't have to work as hard as when they are in action. <coughs> now, how long does maintenance last? Here, there's more. Uh, less clarity and more disagreement in the field. There are those who see maintenance of changing chronic behaviors as lasting a lifetime. So for example, in the recovery movement, you're always in recovery, you're never recovered. On the other hand, historically in the addiction field, most scientists assume that the worst is over in six to 12 months because the relapse curves dropped dramatically from 6 to 12 months. Most of the relapse had occurred, leveled off from 6 to 12 months. And historically, we quit following heroin patients, alcohol abuse patients after 6 to 12 months. In our studies of naturalistic changes over a two-year period, we estimated that maintenance would be more like about a five-year period. People thought we were too pessimistic. But in the Surgeon General's report of 1990 that we helped to author, the national data were clear. After 12 months of not a single puff, what percentage of smokers go back to regular smoking? And it's about 40%. And it's not until five years of total abstinence that the risk of relapse goes down below 5%. Now, when do we consider patients cured from cancer? It's five years without symptom remission. It may well be that the major causes of cancer take five years to cure as well. That doesn't mean that we will be working with the patients for that whole time. It does mean that we need to help them prepare for what will be the highest risk for relapse during that stage. So what's the number one reason across all types of health behaviors and mental health behaviors. Number one reason why people relapse. Any guesses on that? Yes. Maybe they weren't prepared the, the maintenance would take five years and they got discouraged after six to 12 months and they didn't feel recovered. Okay, maybe they weren't prepared for how long maintenance would take and they got discouraged. Actually, it's a much more sophisticated answer and that would be something that we would look at today. And historically, we didn't look at that. Historically, 
what would be the number one predictor of relapse? Any other guesses? Stress. Stress, okay, excellent guess. But I would encourage you to think of it as distress, okay? Distress. Times of depression, anxiety, boredom, hostility, stress, loneliness. Those are the times in which we are at our psychological and emotional weakest, and those are the times in which we are most likely to go back to old patterns and old behaviors. When average Americans are faced with periods of emotional distress, how do they cope? Average American drinks more alcohol, smokes more tobacco, eats more junk foods, takes more over-the-counter drugs, under-the-counter drugs. We are a society that copes with emotional distress through some form of oral consumptive behavior. So then we ask, for populations, what's one of the healthiest oral behaviors that they could use for coping with distress? Any guesses on that? Talking, right? Talking. We clearly know that talking is one of the great buffers for stress and distress. It's part of the reason that the number one reason why people seek psychotherapy is episodes of psychological distress because it does give us some immediate relief, some immediate buffer for that. And we like to take and make available on population basis plans, strategies for coping with times of distress because it hits all of us. Nationally, 85% of, psycho of psychotherapists have had at least one episode of psychological distress syndrome, which is about three months of depression, anxiety, lowered self-esteem, impaired cognitive functioning. I've had at least three of those episodes. The only good thing about it is you learn that it does pass. You learn that you're not going crazy. You learn how to cope with it more effectively. Uh, so besides talking, what would be another way of coping with emotional distress that's healthy and available to large populations. Exercise, right. Exercise, physical activity, clearly an excellent way of managing moods, managing stress, dealing with distress. And the last one, the third, we, and you'll see, we always try to give patients and populations three excellent choices. The third would be some form of deep relaxation, some form of letting go, whether it's yoga, meditation, prayer, deep muscle relaxation, massage, some way of letting that distress leave the body. So, does a patient have a plan for coping with distress? Do they have the skills of one of these forms or another to cope with it? Do they have the resources? If not, we need to help them develop it because that will put them at greatest risk for relapsing. Now, our goal in mental health and in health behaviors is not a lifetime of maintenance, not a lifetime of recovery, but rather to have people recovered, cured whenever possible. Is that possible? In the 70s, a classic study said it's a myth of cure for mental health, that people never get cured from these problems. Some cases that may be the case. Our goal would be to not give up on cures, just as we would never accept oncology giving up on cures. We want people to, whenever possible, be free so they can use their change energies and their executive energies for dealing with other issues in their lives. Here's how we define termination. That is, terminating the problem. Total confidence across all high-risk situations that I will not go back to my self-defeating, self-destructive, unhealthy pattern of behavior. Whether I'm anxious, bored, lonely, stressed, I will not go back to the bottle, I will not go back to the couch, I will not go back to other unhealthy patterns. And zero temptation. Can people reach that? Or is it a lifetime of recovery? Okay. We found with samples of alcoholics in recovery that about 20% reach that criteria, total confidence, zero temptation. With smokers, we about found about 20%. And here's one of the clinical signs, at least with the addictions, when they have terminated, is that they quit dreaming about their substance of choice. And when I did a series with Bill Moyers, an interview on the addictions, 
And I shared that with him at a break, and he publicly said that that series was dedicated to his son, who had struggled with severe cocaine addiction. At the break, he said, I'm so happy to hear you say that, because my son called me a couple weeks ago and said, Dad, I finally quit dreaming about cocaine. So it is possible, but not everybody attains that, and partly because we as professionals and we as scientists don't know enough about how to help people reach that termination point. But let me check with this audience. How many of you are totally confident you're never going back to whole milk again? Okay. <laughs> totally confident. Now, how many of you are totally confident you're never going back to regular ice cream again? Okay. <laughs> You see how behavior specific <laughs> that is? Okay, so it is clearly possible, but uh, here's what we speculate, at least in the health behavior area. When age is on our side, we think we can ha help people to terminate, be home free. When age is against us, it's probably a lifetime of maintenance. And here's what we mean by that. When it comes to the addictions, age is on our side. The older people get, the more likely they are to quit abusing alcohol, to quit drinking. The number one treatment for illicit drug use historically was age. Keep them alive until they're 35, and then you've got a chance of getting them off of illicit drug use because it's a young person's lifestyle. Now the best predictor is getting them married, which is related to age as well. But age is against us when it comes to weight. The older we get, the more likely we are to get overweight. It's against us when it comes to sedentariness. The older we get, the more likely we are to become sedentary. So it may be related to age as one of the determinants. Here's how behavior change occurs across the stages. Early stage, like pre-contemplation, the behavior is under what we call stimulus control. It's much more automatic. It's not something that we decide, that we think about. It's partly what we mean by habit. It's partly what we mean uh, often by uh, behaviors that are not under conscious or decisional control. It is cued and we take and react. Historically, what was the number one cue for people having a cigarette, for smokers having a cigarette? Coffee would be one of the most common ones, in part because nicotine and caffeine are antagonists. They break each other down, so the more caffeine you have, the more nicotine you need to have. But it wasn't the most common. Alcohol, one of the common ones, but not the most common. Seeing another person light up. Seeing another person light up, the kind of modeling behavior, certainly a common one, but not the most common. Having a meal. Having a meal would be one of the common ones, but not the most. Not having enough nicotine in their system. Ah, very good. Okay. <laughs> How often did your average smoker have a cigarette? Average smoker have a cigarette every 30 minutes. Very predictable. Why is that? Because the half-life of nicotine is 30 minutes. So what was the cue for having a cigarette? Nicotine withdrawal. Now that we've brought smoking much more under social controls, the biological cue is less important than things like having a meal, seeing somebody else light up, having a break. Those tend more to be the cues. In the middle stages, Behavior is more under decisional control. Is it worth it? Is it not? Should I keep progressing? Should I put it off? Should I keep struggling? Should I give up? Decisional control, much weaker form of behavior control. Ideally, we would like to bring the new behavior, the new healthy pattern, under stimulus control again, where it's automatic, we don't have to think about it, we just do it. How many of you have your seatbelt under stimulus control? Automatic. Don't, okay. Now, I don't know if you realize, but seat belts were in cars way before a majority of people used them. It wasn't until industry added buzzers and lights to cue people and reinforce people that it started to become more automatic. Right? So that would be the kind of pattern we would like to see. So, for example, here's me with uh, uh, skim milk. <coughs> Shopping list, I just write down skim. Don't think about it, write it down. In front of the cooler, pick out the green half gallon, green stimulus for skim milk. Contrast that with me in front of the ice cream cooler. Do I take regular ice cream 
yogurt, premium yogurt, no fat, decisional control, much weaker, much more likely to lapse. So ideally, bringing it back under <coughs> stimulus control would be the ideal. If we can't bring the behavior under stimulus control, then the next best form of self-control is what we call rule control. Let me check. How many of you have your exercise under stimulus control? Same time, same place. All right. Higher than average percentage. Usually it's about 10%. If you can't bring it under stimulus control, and I don't have mine under stimulus control, then the next most powerful form is rule control. So, for example, my rule for life is I will exercise vigorously at least three times a week for 45 minutes. No matter whether I'm traveling, busy, bad weather, not feeling well, I can live by that rule. Okay. Another rule for myself, growing up in a family with father with uh, um, manic depressive disorder, alcohol problems, uh, violence problems, I had periods of alcohol abuse, so I finally got to a point where I set a rule for my life, I will never drink more than three drinks on any occasion. And I can live by that rule, I don't have to worry about making decisions on any particular occasion. So, the best we may get to would be rule control, but that's a lot more powerful than struggling with decisions at each point of temptation, each point of risk of relapse. So let's take and apply this stage model to five of the most important issues for intervening on these major health and mental health problems. Managed care has put great emphasis on outcomes, but in fact, outcomes are often a function of inputs. For example, how important are outcomes if all we reach with the number one killer of our time is 1% of smokers? How important is that? So we start with saying, how can we reach many more patients with mental health problems and health problems than we ever have in the past? For example, most clinicians can treat depression on an individual patient's basis. But few clinicians know how to treat depression on a population basis. Even though the majority of depressions go undiagnosed, misdiagnosed, untreated, mistreated, costing people in terms of quality of life, quantity of life, and health care costs, we do not treat depression effectively on a population basis. We don't treat any of the addictions effectively. We treat very few problems on a population basis. So let's start with how do we reach many more people than we have in the past? Here's what we've been able to demonstrate. Our prototype is with smoking. There the base rates were clear, 1 to 5 percent nationally participating. We reached out to entire population, one study, 5,000 smokers, all socioeconomic groups, ages, ethnic groups. We offered them treatment whether they were ready to quit, getting ready, or not ready. We had to let them know that this was a program for wherever they were at. And we were able to recruit over 80% of those smokers. Working with a, a uh, HMO in New England, we reached out to 4,500 smokers that they sent a letter to. We were able to recruit 85%. With teenage smokers, Surgeon General's report said, forget teenage smokers. They will not participate. We reached out to about 6,000 teenagers in Rhode Island, and we recruited close to 90%. And we recruited more in the inner cities than in the suburbs. So we've solved that problem. Two principles. One is we have to reach out to them rather than wait for them to reach us. The second is we have to let them know that we are offering programs for whatever stage they are in because they are likely to assume, unless they are ready to take action, why bother? And they will assume that this program is for people who are more action-oriented. So once we recruit high percentages, will we retain them? One of the major skeletons in the closet of mental health services in health behavior services is the dropout problem. Across 125 studies of all kinds of problems, 
heroin addiction, alcoholism, depression, mental health generally, weight management, smoking, it didn't matter. Percentage of people who drop out quickly and prematurely, about 50%. Okay. What's the percentage of people who discontinue life-saving medications quickly and prematurely? About 50%. 50% of patients go off of antidepressants in the first month. 50% of patients go off of cholesterol-lowering medications in the first few months. 50% of patients go off the best medications for multiple sclerosis, for lupus, for ulcers. It doesn't matter. It's lawful. Okay. What are the best predictors of dropout, of discontinuation? Historically, we weren't able to predict very much at all. Historically, it was minority status, lower education, and having an addiction problem. Now there are about eight studies in areas of rehabilitation, mental health, obesity, heroin treatment, alcohol treatment, and at least where there have been comparative predictors, the best predictors have been what stage people are in. Okay. In our, one of our mental health studies, we were able to predict over 90% of those who terminated prematurely and quickly as judged by their therapist. Let me go to the pattern. The yellow line is, in this study, it was 40% who dropped out within the first three sessions. On our Eureka scale, a 32-item questionnaire, this whole group had a profile of people in pre-contemplation. Those who finished therapy quickly but appropriately, as judged by the therapist, the green line, those who were patients who had a profile on this scale as being in action, and those who continued with longer-term treatment was a mixed group, most of them in contemplation. Now, if we had patients coming in, let's say with an addiction problem like alcoholism, who had recently taken action, what would our clinical strategy or clinical plan be? What would our treatment protocol look like for patients who have recently taken action on an addiction? Any guesses on that? Okay. Relapse prevention. Okay. Relapse prevention for those who are in action because we know the number one risk for them is relapse during this stage. Now, does relapse prevention make any sense for, in this case, the 40% who came in in pre-contemplation? What would our clinical strategy be for those folks? Psychoeducation would be like a, a, a kind of a technique or therapy that we would use for the strategy of dropout prevention, okay? Because the number one risk for these folks is dropping out. So when I have a patient that I see who's in pre-contemplation, I let them know my biggest concern is, is that they are likely to drop out before I have a chance to make a difference in their lives. And so I will let them know that, and I will share with them in terms of what stage they're in. We also know that patients in this stage will perceive coercion even when it's not there. When we looked at a study of, of uh, people with heroin and cocaine addiction, were they in therapy out of choice or out of coercion? Coercion being like sent by the court, sent by social service, sent by the employer, threats of divorce. We found no difference by actual coercion. But by perceived coercion, those patients in pre-contemplation saw themselves in therapy more out of coercion than out of choice. So one of the things I share with those patients is, if you experience me as becoming coercive, let me know. Because I know that that's the last thing that you need at this point. I know that you will be very sensitive to somebody trying to get you to take action when that's not where you're at. And if you feel me as unduly pressuring you and coercing you, that can drive you away. I don't want to do that. Let's make sure we continue to talk about that. Okay? We have now about five, six growing number of large population trials looking at dropout prevention. When we take and match treatment to patient stage, we remove the number one predictor of dropout. Those in pre-contemplation complete treatment at the same high rates as those in preparation, okay, by matching their stage. 
So how do we do that? First, we assess what stage they're in, and we have both brief treatments and uh, assessments, uh, like five items, and 32 item assessments. Then we let them know what stage they're in. We let them know where they are in terms of the course of change. We often talk about ourselves as like the AAA of behavior change. We'll give you a map. We'll give you some guides. If you get stuck, you can call on us, okay? And we will help you to find the best way to your goals. And here's the part of the thing, is setting realistic goals for them. So for example, if a patient is in pre-contemplation, the goal is not to go to immediate action. That will drive them away. That will cause them to be much more likely to drop out. The goal is to help them progress to contemplation. If we help them progress to contemplation in brief interactions, we double the chances that they're taking effective action in the next six months. If we help them to progress two stages, we triple to quadruple the chances they're taking effective action. So we set realistic goals, one stage at a time, and that's something that they're much more likely to be able to succeed at. Let's see then, once we set those goals, what do we need to do to help them progress? Same principles across every behavior that we have studied and that we've seen in the literature. For patients to progress from pre-contemplation to contemplation, their awareness, their appreciation of the benefits of taking action must go up. If the pros don't go up, it means our intervention is not working. It's like not seeing blood pressure come down, not seeing cholesterol come down. Our behavior medicine isn't working. It's the same thing with preventing dropout from therapy. People who enter therapy in pre-contemplation underestimate the benefits of therapy, overestimate the cost of therapy, and they're not conscious that they're making that mistake. Right? Now, here's exercise. How many benefits are there from regular exercise? We can ask the patient, what are the benefits that you're aware of from regular exercise? Couch potato and pre-contemplation will list about five or six. Okay? We let them know there are over 50 benefits from regular exercise. Let's see if you can double your list between now and the next time. Let's carry that over to therapy. How many benefits are you aware of from completing a course of therapy? Let's take and chart that. And let's see if your awareness of more benefits can go up. How many benefits are there from patients completing psychotherapy? What are the benefits? Can you share that with your patients? I'll bet patients are more aware of the benefits of exercise than they are aware of all the benefits of psychotherapy. We do a terrible job of preparing our patients for what can come from psychotherapy. If we don't see those pros going up, they're going to drop out. Pros of therapy as well as pros of taking action. Okay? Cons go up often. We don't worry about the cons coming down until they're in contemplation. Then we need to see the cons come down. What's the number one reason why Americans don't exercise regularly? What do you think? Time. Time. Yep. Time. Time is the number one reason in the United States. It's the number one reason in Japan. It's the number one reason in Mexico, Germany, Finland, and it's the number one reason amongst retired Americans. Okay. <laughs> time. Now, time will be a much bigger barrier if you're only going to get 50 benefits, I mean five benefits. If you can get 10 times that number of benefits, then you start to realize this becomes the bargain basement of behaviors. There is nothing that you can get that many benefits for 60 minutes of your time. Though so psychotherapy is close, okay? Psychotherapy is close. Nothing that can give you that many benefits. Now, do you like, do you like uh, bargains? Will you take time for bargains? And how much time will you drive around the parking lot trying to get close to the store to get that bargain? Okay. You like bargains? This is the behavior for you. You like bargains? Therapy can be the, the uh, bargain for you if you are aware of all that it can help you with. Okay. So same principles, diet, weight control, condom use. This was a, a study done with CDC, IV drug users, prostitutes, street youth. 
What do you think was the number one pro for consistently using condoms in this population? Any guesses on that? <coughs> Protection from AIDS, good guess. That was number two. Uh, any other guesses? Uh, venereal disease, STDs, that was number three. Uh, birth control, that was in the top five, was not in the top five for this population, but I appreciate your, your guessing. We could probably take the rest of the afternoon. You probably wouldn't get it. Number one pro, I would be a more responsible human being. Okay. What's the lesson learned about that? Don't stereotype our populations. Don't assume we know what will move people. Let's talk to them and see what really matters to them. But also, in most of these areas, we need to be more responsible human beings. Most of behavioral health is an active problem, not just a passive problem. It's not just something that happens to us. It's something that we participate in, and we do need to be more responsible for our part of the problem. Smoking, quitting cocaine. This one is interesting. It's the only problem we ever saw that people in action had the cons higher than the pros. And this is the only sample where we were working primarily with residential treatment, inpatient care, and here's how we interpret that pattern. We think that that, that action is much more under social control, inpatient, residential. That would not be a good profile for discharging people because they are clearly at high risk to going back uh, to cocaine. We want to see uh, those pros over the cons. Okay, moving ahead. This is one of my favorite ones. Physicians practicing behavior medicine with their patients. What's the number one reason why U.S. physicians do not practice behavior medicine with their patients? Any guesses? Success. Success. Actually, that's what's related. Uh, time is number two. Being reimbursed is number three. Number one reason. Two-thirds of American physicians have come to believe that their patients either cannot change their behavior or will not change their behavior. You want to know why physicians don't deal with alcohol, don't deal with smoking, don't deal with depression, don't deal with violence, don't deal with almost all of the major killers and cost drivers? Because they don't believe it's worthwhile. Okay? And so time becomes the number one barrier. And part of the problem is we continue to prescribe action to primary care physicians. Try to get all your patients to exercise. Try to get all of them to start losing weight. Try to get all of them to take their medications right away. Prescribing medications is an action paradigm. I mean, here's what happened. Patients get diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Ther the physician, in all good conscience, says, you've got to take your medication four times a day. You've got to test your blood glucose four times a day. You've got to quit smoking. You've got to lose weight. You have to change your diet. You have to start exercising, reduce your alcohol intake, and lower your stress. Good luck. You want to create a non-compliant patient? Prescribe all that action when they're not ready. They came in to get a diagnosis. They didn't come in to overhaul their life. Okay? And what we know is that patients with four of these kinds of problems with diabetes, less than 10% are ready to take action on two or more behaviors. So we start them with action with where they're ready while they're progressing on the other behaviors where they're not ready. Okay? So we don't overwhelm them and we don't overwhelm ourselves. Okay, gets a little more complex. With patients in pre-contemplation, consciousness raising, the most widely used process across all types of psychotherapy, various techniques for using this, things like feedback, observations, interpretations, confrontation, but also things like information and education. In the 1970s, we concluded education doesn't change behavior. Do you believe that? Why do we conclude that? Because we tested everything by whether it led to immediate action. Consciousness raising, education information doesn't lead to action. It leads to contemplation. And we need to assess these processes by what they are designed to lead to. We also concluded fear doesn't change behavior. Do you believe that? You believe millions of Americans would have changed their sex practices if it wasn't for the fear of HIV and AIDS? Fear doesn't lead to action. It leads to contemplation. So 
arousing affect. And sometimes it's like with fear, why are you so intent on killing yourself? Sometimes it's with inspiration. Look at this wonderful example of somebody who was able to transcend the very problem that you're faced with. Okay? But emotionally arousing and saying, this can help move you towards more seriously thinking about taking action. Environmental reevaluation. How will my changing affect my environment as well as myself? If I quit drinking, how will that affect my friends and my family who also drink a great deal? One colleague, or actually a patient who I helped to lose uh, 150 pounds, his sisters never reinforced him, his parents never commented on his weight loss, and all of them were obese. So he was the odd one out, and he was a threat to them. Okay? So complex processes. But here's California media campaign using simple techniques, using this model to reach entire population. Man clearly in grief. I always worried that my smoking would lead to lung cancer. I always was afraid that my smoking would cause an early death. But I never imagined it would happen to my wife. And then on the screen, California Department of Health, 50,000 deaths a year due to passive smoking. 30 seconds, consciousness raising, 50,000 deaths a year. Emotion, dramatic relief, raising that guilt, that anxiety, and lowering it by thinking about quitting smoking. Environmental reevaluation, how it will benefit others as well as myself. Okay? Self reevaluation, how do I think and feel about myself as a couch potato? How will I think and feel about myself as a more active person? Okay. Many couch potatoes see joggers as road hazards, okay. <laughs> public nuisance. I mean, who wants to be one of those? So we have to help create a s kinds of self-images that will draw people into healthy futures, just like the tobacco industry creates images that draw young people into unhealthy futures. Behavior change, even with these more Limited kinds of habits or behaviors usually involve changes in self-image and in changes in one's sense of identity as well. Uh, okay, moving ahead. Self-liberation. This comes from the existential model. By the way, these come from very different models of psychotherapy. This is what the public calls willpower. It's the belief that I can change my behavior and the commitments to act on that belief. Can we enhance our patient's willpower? Or is it a trait that they have? Patients tend to think of it as a trait, and they attribute their failures. I didn't have enough willpower. If I don't have enough willpower, what can I do about it? It's like I didn't have enough motivation. What can I do about it? Okay. Well, here's some of the ways we can enhance willpower. If people go public with their commitment, it will be stronger than if they keep it private. If we give them two choices, it'll be stronger than if we give them one choice. If we give them three choices, it'll be stronger than if we give them two. Four doesn't add anything. So we always try to give patients three excellent choices. So for example, if you say, you must go to AA, you will not strengthen willpower as much as if you give them two choices. And if you give them three, they will be more committed to whichever one they choose than if you say, you must go to AA. So that's why, like with coping with distress, Relaxing, exercising, talking, three excellent choices. Okay, reinforcement management. We looked at both reinforcement and punishment. We found that people changing on their own used a great deal of reinforcement. They didn't use a whole lot of punishment. We speculate that we reserve punishment for changing other people's behavior, okay, like our spouses, employees, children, uh, whereas we use reinforcement ourselves. Here's something we have to prepare people for. They will not get reinforced by others as much as they expect. They expect others to praise them, recognize them, reinforcement more. Others start to take their changes for granted too soon, and so they need to be prepared to reinforce themselves more. And it's like a good parent, like a good coach. Nice job, good going, you can do it, keep it up, you're on your way, a boy, a girl. I was out golfing with a guy who had uh, been sent to golf by his doctor after having a heart attack. I take and hit one in the woods. I say, oh, well, I'll see if I can scramble out of there. He hits one in the woods. You dumb SOB, you jerk, you, you can't do anything right. I said, you know, it's great that your doctor told you about exercise. 
But I'm going to teach you about chronic hostility, okay? Because that's another major factor for having another heart attack. You need to take and reparent yourself. You clearly had a parent that was much too punitive. Let's model and say, nice shot when you have a good one, bad shot, we all hit him. If we didn't, we'd be on the tour, and let's keep moving ahead. Sometimes we use this uh, creatively with weight loss in our programs. For every pound that the woman loses, the teenage daughter gets $10. Okay. Okay. You want social support? You want social monitoring? The kids love to parent their parents. All right, helping relationships. Uh, we all know how important that is. Somebody who cares, somebody we can be open with, somebody who uh, we can count on. Uh, and here was a study done in Quebec. People with heart attacks who are socially isolated and problems with depression. You know what depression does to heart attacks? Depression is the equivalent to smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. Okay? That's what a killer it is. Those folks are randomly assigned to proactive volunteer home visits. Those who randomly receive those social helping relationships proactively a year later had 50% fewer deaths. 50% fewer deaths. If that was a drug, it would be on the cover of the time in Newsweek. Okay. We know how important a therapeutic relationship is. We never realize that it can save lives as well as enhance quality of life. Counter conditioning, substituting healthy alternatives for unhealthy alternatives like nicotine replacement for smoking, exercise for drinking, other kinds of healthy alternatives. And then stimulus control, re-engineering the environment to take and evoke positive behaviors like mainstreaming folks in the community so that they have opportunities and environments that encourage more uh, positive kinds of behaviors. Uh, here's one I recommended to the Air Force. The higher your rank in the Air Force, the further your parking space should be from the building. Okay? And I got a, a great applause from the enlisted people. Okay? We've got that all wrong. Here's an example with depression. We tend to think of pre depression as a passive problem. I was talking at lunch about consulting in uh, Finland. And I'm listening on the elevators in the taxi. The most common, this was like 1988, 1989, the most common folk singer on the radio was Leonard Cohen. You remember Leonard Cohen? All about death and destruction, drugs and suicide. I mean, you want to get depressed, go with Leonard Cohen. And I know from my own life, I, mean, I had periods of depression. When I was depressed, who would I read? The existentialists. Okay? What music would I listen to? Leonard Cohen. Okay? What would I tell myself? As a Central European, the purpose of life is to suffer. Or I tell myself, fun is for fools. Okay? I mean, I fed my depression. Now, when we went in, we did some nice stuff with self-changes and how creative they are. Here's a Isolated woman, elderly woman, living in, in Detroit in a not safe neighborhood. How does she deal with depression? Instead of like in Finland where they adopted the tangle, she puts a poke on. Stim is controlled. Starts to evoke dancing. She joined three churches. She's Catholic, Southern Baptist, and Bible student. <laughs> she gets three times as much help in relationship. Okay? And then... If there's nobody around, she walks a half block down to the funeral home and joins the mourners. <laughs> and in five minutes, they're talking about life. And she'd say, gee, that Frank was a great guy. And then they would be interacting. Now, is that creative problem solving? <laughs> right? Would any therapist think of that? I mean, I truly believe in the wisdom of ordinary people, and we need to learn from that. Well, we're reaching the end of our time today. What I have shared with you is something that was taught to us by ordinary people. What I won't be able to go into is all the applications that we have done with very high participation rates and the kinds of outcomes that we're able to produce even while dealing with very high participation rates. But I'm convinced that really helping populations of troubled people begins with changing our behavior and changing our minds. And I'm pleased to have a chance to interact with you today. And we will go to questions, comments, some time for interaction. Yes? Um, I have a million questions. I'll start with one. 
Um, there are some uh, researchers who advocate that change should happen very dramatically and quickly. I'm thinking of Dean Ornstein, who recommends that you change your diet very dramatically and that that's the best way to sustain change. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about um, whether change should come quickly or slowly. Okay, people heard that question. Uh, yeah, I've, Dean Ornish and I have talked about that. Dean recognizes that his folks are going to be a very highly select uh, number, you know, patient population. I mean, these are folks who typically have had life-threatening heart attacks. These are folks who would typically pay, you know, five to six thousand dollars to go to uh, California for uh, several weeks. Uh, and he still is concerned about his dropouts and his treatment. Uh, what I would do is I would assess them. If these are folks who are ready to take action on their diet, on their exercise, on their smoking after that kind of event, full speed ahead. No question about it. On the other hand, if they're ready to take action on their diet but not on their exercise, we would have them take action on their diet while they're progressing on exercise. I mean, here's an example. I talked about weight going like this, participation in weight loss programs going like that. Average woman, and it's mostly women who go to Weight Watchers, ready to change their diet in pre-contemplation for exercising. What's the number one predictor of success with long-term weight management? It's exercise, okay? So it doesn't mean you don't start them and change their diet where they're ready, but you don't push them to exercise when they're not, but you start to help them progress. So that would be on an individual case basis. If they're ready, or if you're a population that's highly selected, then you may be uh, looking. But once you go to action, that's pretty dramatic. Right? But I wouldn't, we certainly wouldn't be pushing people to action who aren't ready for it. Okay. Yes? I don't have this fully formed yet, but it seems to me that um, when you started talking about uh, cure versus uh, remission, um, that that's a model that is um, becoming outdated even though general medicine still pers pursues it because there are very few things it seems to me that can be cured by a curer or a doc or whatever that that what we're dealing with is uh, a care caring working in conjunction with human beings and human biological systems and that um, what you're suggesting seems to be more along that line and that um, having cure as a outcome measure is just a, a red herring. Okay, let me respond because I think there's a couple of important points that I'm hearing that you're making. One is the issue is do we cure patients or do we rely primarily on self-curing? Okay. In psychotherapy, there's no question, we rely, I mean, at least twice as much variance is due to the client's efforts than to our efforts. Only about 10% of the outcome variance is what goes on in therapy. Average patient spends less than 1% of their wake and week in therapy when they're in therapy. Okay? So what they do in the other 99% is going to have a great deal to do with the outcomes. On the other hand, in most of biological medicine, they're heavily dependent on self-care as well. Okay? I mean, look what happened with HIV and AIDS. If you don't have your self-healing mechanisms working for you, I mean, it rendered modern medicine helpless. Okay? So they're heavily dependent on self-care as well. So it's not an issue of who is doing the curing. It's an issue of what should our goal be. Okay? What should our goal be? Not that we can always attain it, but here's a mistake that we made in psychotherapy out research, research outcomes. We looked at statistical improvement. And we were able to show that 70 to 80 percent of patients who were in psychotherapy were better off than those who weren't, statistically, okay? Because we used statistical improvement rather than something like recovery or cure uh, as an outcome. It was great. We advertised that. Right? But in the addiction field, we said, wait a minute. 70 to 80 percent of the patients don't succeed. Why was that? Here is the same treatment. It was because addictions were tougher problems? Like anxiety disorders, we said 75 percent, you know, were successful. But when you went and looked at those with agoraphobia, who were actually free from panic reactions, who were actually free to move about in the world, the success rate, as shown by Neil Jacobson, was 27 percent. 
very similar to the success rate when we use abstinence with the addictions. Okay? So the, the outcomes are different. But here was a problem when we settled for statistical improvement. It didn't matter how long therapy was. It didn't matter how educated the therapy was. It didn't matter how experienced the therapist was. And what happened with managed care? It went with the briefest and the cheapest, and we yelled foul. Okay? I think it was part because we used a criteria that was just too easy, and I think it came back to haunt us. I'm not saying we can get cure all everywhere. I'm saying if the public doesn't want a statistically improved alcoholic, now, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to be home free. But damn, a hell of a lot better to have your life organized around things other than alcohol, if you can. And lots of times, patients in recovery have their life still organized around alcohol. It may be the best we can do, but that's not where we should end up in terms of our goal, you know, ultimately. Certainly, they're chronic conditions. Let's say, for example, diabetes type 1, chronic condition. But you can get to the point where your medication is automatic, your testing is automatic, your ex the things that manage it so that you're at your fullest capacity and highest quality of life, those things you can make more automatic. The diabetes itself may still be a chronic disease that you're having to manage, but the quantity and quality of your life can be greatly enhanced by having as a goal people being able to have those new behaviors be more automatic. Because otherwise... You, it, it really weighs people down if they're continuing having to make decisions, continuing having to struggle, and lots of patients with diabetes who are seen as non-compliant. Okay, so it's an ideal, not always reasonable, realizable. That's what I was trying to really say once I thought about it: is healing versus curing, and and that brings up a whole nother philosophical discussion, some of which you touched on. Okay. Yeah. But you remember those data mm -hmm. on the helping relationship? Mm -hmm. I think caring is healing. Yes, one last question, maybe. I want to say that we talked a lot about your theories in our doctoral seminars, um, Sungman and other folks, and you um, scared us because as practi practitioners in mental health, we were doing the slow one-by-one -one approach. And you said, you know, that really isn't enough and we need to do population interventions. So I'm a convert and I believe what you say. Um, what I'd like to ask you, though, is for the people that the center sees most often, people with chronic and severe mental illness, have you looked at whether that, special, that group is a special group in terms of learning in the same way as the rest of the population? I don't know the answer. And also, does it need does, does that population need different approaches, more information spread over more time? I mean, whatever. Have you looked at that? Uh, I mean, the question was clear. Uh, I have not. There are others who are looking at that. Uh, and part of my speculation is, is I, I, there's no question there are populations that are going to need more social support, more helping relationships, more long-term kinds of caring and, uh, and all. Uh, and I think the, uh, uh, the severity of the kind of problems, the number of kinds of areas that uh, need help uh, will make a, a real difference. But um, uh, frankly, I, I always loved uh, Harry Stack Sullivan's you know, statement that uh, schizophrenic patients are more like us than they are different. And I think that what we look to do there is to, and on, on the therapy side, from my perspective, is try to enhance their personal freedom as much as, as we can and to try and maximize their uh, self-actualization as much as we can. I do see that as though uh, a longer-term process and one that, uh, that clearly requires more resources. But... You know, this is an area in mental health. It's, uh, I mean, APA, American Psychological Association, is trying to get the message out there, pay me now or pay me later. You know the data? Support for mental health services and managed care went down disproportionately compared to all other treatments, and costs of disability went markedly up. Okay? So it's, you know, pay me now or pay me later. If we don't uh, help people with the problems when uh, earlier on, we'll pay more later on. I mean, in some sense, an empirical question about whether there needs to be a different treatment. I'm not sure of the answer. 
Is there a way to break out your current data on, let's say, these new studies you and Dr. Bellasser have done um, in terms of that kind of stuff? I mean, just, just to find out whether there was any difference. Well, what we do know, and here's the question of when are you dealing with single behavior problems versus multiple behavior problems? For example, we know with uh, addictions, if people have a history of clinical depression, they're going to need some specialized services. Okay? The standard services for dealing with addictions aren't going to uh, be sufficient. But that's in part because you've got a multiple behavior problem situation here. Uh, and so we need to look at what are all the different behaviors or, or, or problems that we need to help uh, with, you know, with changing. Here's the good news. I, I, we didn't have a chance to get into this. We, we have looked on a population basis, proactively reaching out, treating populations for one behavior like smoking, then comparing them to populations where we treated for three behaviors, diet, smoking, and sun exposure. Another one, four behaviors, diet, smoking, sun exposure, and exercise. Which group will do better? Will you treat just one behavior, like smoking, or will you treat four behaviors? Who does better? Turns out, no difference. No difference. Yet, the health benefits and the health care cost benefits are hugely different. But recognize, those with four behaviors, 10% or less are ready to take action on two or more. So you will be guessing out of the action paradigm. Yeah, if you told them to take action on four at once, you're going to overwhelm them. But you only take action on one at most with a typical person while they're progressing on the other ones. So I think with, with certainly with the, the uh, kinds of populations that you help, you've got multiple you know, problem folks, and so you're going to need to be uh, looking at multiple behaviors. But you can be more ambitious. We, what we don't know is beyond four. At some point, it's probably going to be too much. Uh, but it's very encouraging that, that dealing with multiple looks to get the same outcomes as when we deal with just a single one. So lesson learned. We can be, I believe, much more ambitious than we have in the past. You know, I came back from CDC where they had adopted this model for all of their HIV and AIDS program. And the I, uh, president of our university said, that, he said, that must be very exciting. I said, it's also very scary. The idea, I think it's very exciting that we can take and reach out to entire populations. It is also scary because it causes us to have to change. Here's some first places we should do it. By practice, standard practice, and you'd be sued if you didn't do it. You have a woman who has a first degree relative with breast cancer, you've got to be assessing her at least once a year. Right? What happens if you've got an adolescent who has one parent who's had clinical depression? What happens if you have a kid who's had one or two parents one parent with an addiction problem, five times as likely to have an addiction. Two parents goes up to 70% likelihood. Two parents with depression, 70% likelihood. We ought to be seeing those kids proactively, regularly developing a relationship, doing preventative work, because we know, just like women with first degree relatives with breast cancer, these are high risk kids who are going to have high risk costs and diminish lives if we don't start practicing that way. I did that with my clinical practice and my my clients very much appreciated that I was reaching out and trying to take care of the next generation. Because one of the things I loved was when couples would come to me and say, we came to you because we want the neurosis to stop with our generation. Right? And here's another thing. You, here you don't need, I did a lot of couples therapy. Husband and wife come into therapy, what stage is the husband in? Pre-contemplation. Pre <laughs> right? <laughs> and what stage is the wife in? Action. <laughs> You wonder why they got conflict, right? You don't need our test to diagnose that, but you do need to be sensitive how to help them when they're in two very different places. Listen, thanks a lot for your time and attention. Thank you.